brought to you by BunnySlippers.com. Check out their brand new Dino Sound Slippers. Slippers make a roaring sound every three steps. Made with green scaly fabric, soft plush uppers, foam footbeds, non-slip grips on soles, and three white claws on each foot. One size fits most up to women's ten and a half, men's nine. Footbed measures ten and a half. Black Clock Audio Tales is a daily podcast that reads you a story, either a chapter of a novel or a whole short story. Join us in our exploration of old ghost stories, supernatural fiction, horror tales, folk tales, fantasy, gothic horror, weird fiction, and cosmic horror. And don't forget to join us for our monthly show about the Cthulhu Mythos. Look for our podcast near the old wishing well in the Blasted Heath, wherever you find your podcast. We suggest Podbean or Apple Podcasts. Find us on the web at pgttcm.com and at Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and Black Clock Audio Tales on YouTube. Welcome to Black Clock Audio Tales. Check out our new website over at www.pgttcm.com. Edited by Daniel Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod. The Chamber, A Price of Gloom, Despair. Welcome to Part 1, Folklore of Great Britain. Join us at the end of the month when we talk about the Great Old Ones. Chapter 20 of Walsh Fairy Tales Chapter 20 Paul and His Bride Not far from the castle where King Paul had his court, there was a hillock called the Mount of Macbeth. It was the common belief that some strange adventure would befall anyone who should sit upon that mound. He would receive blows or wounds or else he would see something wonderful. Thus came to pass that none but peaceful bards had ever sat upon the mound. Never a warrior or common man had risked sitting there. The general fear felt that the awe inspired by the place was too great. But after his adventure of being king of Fairyland for a whole year, everything else to Paul seemed dull and commonplace. So, to test his own courage and worthiness of kingship, Paul assembled all his lords at Narbeth. After the night's feasting, revelry, and storytelling, Paul declared that the next day he would sit upon the enchanted mound. So when the sun was fully risen, Paul took his seat upon the mound, expecting that, all of a sudden, something unusual would happen. For some minutes nothing, whether event or vision, took place. Then he lifted up his eyes and saw approaching him a white horse on which rode a lady. She was dressed in shining garments, as if made of gold. Evidently she was a princess, yet she came not very near. Does anyone among you know who this lady is? asked Paul of his chieftains. Not one of us, was the answer. Thereupon Paul ordered his vassals to ride forward. They were to greet her courteously and inquire who she was. But now the predicted wonder took place. She moved away from them, yet at a quiet pace that suited her. Though the knights spurred their horses and rode fast and furiously, they could not come any nearer to her. They galloped back and reported their failure to reach the lady. Then Paul picked out others and sent them riding after the lady, but each time one and all returned, chagrined with failure. A woman had beaten them. So the day closed with silence in the castle hall. There was no merrymaking or storytelling that night. The next day Paul sat again on the mound, and once more the golden lady came near. This time, Paul himself left his seat on the mound, leaped on his fleetest horse, and pursued the maiden robed in gold on the white horse. But she flitted away as she had done before from the knights. Again and again, though he could get nearer and nearer to her, he failed. Then the baffled king cried out in despair, O maiden fair, for the sake of him who thou lovest, stay for me. Evidently the lady, who lived in the time of castles and courts, did not care to be wooed in the style of the caveman. Such manners did not suit her, but with a change of method of making love, her heart melted. Besides, she was a kind woman. She took pity on horses as well as on men. Sweet was her voice, as she answered most graciously, I will stay gladly, 
and it were better for thy horses, hadst thou asked me properly long ago. To his questions as to how and why she came to him, she told her story as follows. I am Rhiannon, descended from the august and venerable one of old. My aunts and uncles tried to make me marry against my will a chieftain named Gwal, an auburn-haired youth, son of Clud. But, because my love to thee, would I have no husband, and if you reject me, I will never marry any man. As heaven is my witness, were I to choose amongst all the damsels and ladies of the world, thee I would choose, cried Paul. After that, it was agreed that, when a year had sped, Paul should go to the palace of the august and venerable one of old, and claim her for his bride. So, when twelve months had passed, Paul, with his retinue of a hundred knights, all splendidly horsed and finely apparelled, presented himself before the castle. There he found his fair lady, and a feast already prepared, at which he sat with her. On the other side of the table were her father and mother. In the midst of this joyous occasion, when all was gaiety, and they talked together, in strode a youth clad in sheeny satin. He was of noble bearing and had auburn hair. He saluted Paul and his knights courteously. At once Paul, the lord of Narbath, invited the stranger to come and sit down as a guest beside him. Not so, replied the youth. I am a suitor, and have come to crave a boon from thee. Without guile or suspicion, Paul replied innocently, Ask what you will, if in my power it shall be yours. But Rhiannon chided Paul. She asked, Oh, why did you give him such an answer? But he did give it, cried the auburn-haired youth. Then turning to the whole company of nobles, he appealed to them. Did he not pledge his word before you all to give me what I asked? Then, turning to Paul, he said, The boon I ask is this, to have thy bride, Rhiannon. Further, I want this feast and banquet to celebrate, in this place our wedding. At this demand, Paul seemed to have been struck dumb. He did not speak, but Rhiannon did. Be silent, as long as thou wilt, she cried. But surely no man ever made worse use of his wits than thou hast done. For this man, to whom thou gavest thy oath of promise, is none other than Gwal, the son of Clud. He is the suitor from whom I fled to come to you, whilst you sat on the Narbath mound. Now out of such trouble, how should the maiden promised to two men be delivered? Her wit saved her for the nonce. Paul was bound to keep his word, but Rhiannon explained to Gwal, that it was not his castle or hall, so he could not give the banquet. But in a year from that date, if Gual would come for her, she would be his bride. Then a new bridal feast would be set for the wedding. In the meantime, Rhiannon planned with Paul to get out of the trouble. For this purpose, she gave him a magical bag, which he was to use when the right time should come. Quickly, the twelve months passed, and then Gual appeared again to claim his bride, and a great feast was spread in his honor. All were having a good time, when in the midst of their merriment a beggar appeared in the hall. He was in rags, and carried the usual beggar's wallet for food or alms. He asked only that out of the abundance of the table his bag might be filled. Gual agreed, and ordered his servants to attend to the matter. But the bag never got full. What they put into it, or how much, made no difference. Dish after dish was emptied. By degrees, most of the food on the table was in the beggar's bag. My soul alive! Will that bag never get full? asked Gual. No, by heaven. Not unless some rich man shall get into it. Stamp down with his feet, and call out enough. Then Rhiannon, who sat beside Gual, urged him to attempt the task, by putting his two feet in the bag to stamp it down. No sooner had Gual done this than the supposed beggar pushed him down inside the bag, then drawing the mouth shut, 
he tied it tight over Gual's head. Then the beggar's rags dropped, and there stood forth the handsome leader, Paul. He blew his horn, and in rushed his knights, who overcame and bound the followers of Gual. They then proceeded to play a merry game of football, using the bag in which Gual was tied, as men in our day kick pigskin. One called to his mate or rival, What's in the bag? And the others answered, A badger. So they played the game of badger in the bag, kicking it around the hall. They did not let the prisoner out of the bag until he promised to pay the pipers, the harpers, and the singers who should come to the wedding of Paul and Rhiannon. He must give up all his claims and register a vow never to take revenge. This oath given and promises made, the bag was opened and the agreements solemnly confirmed in the presence of all. Then Gual and every one of his men, knights and servants, were let go, and they went back to their own country. A few evenings later, in the large banqueting hall, Paul and Rhiannon were married. Beside the great feast, presents were given to all present, high and low. Then the happy pair made their wedding journey to Gual's palace at Narbeth. There the lovely bride gave a ring or a gem to every lord and lady in her new realm and everybody was happy. Chapter 21 of Welsh Fairy Tales For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Kathleen Welsh Fairy Tales by William Elliot Griffiths Why the Back Door Was Front In the days when were no books or writing and folk tales were the only ones told, there was an old woman who had a bad reputation she pretended to be very poor so as not to attract or tempt robbers yet those who knew her best knew also as a subject of common talk that she was always counting out her coins besides this she lived in a nice house and it was believed that she made a living by stealing babies out of their cradles to sell to the bad fairies it was matter of rumour that she would for an extra large sum take a wicked fairy's ugly brat and put it in place of a mother's darling in addition to these horrid charges against her it was rumoured that she laid a spell or charm on the cattle of people whom she did not like in order to take revenge on them the old woman denied all this and declared it was only silly gossip of envious people who wanted her money she lived so comfortably she averred because her son who was a stonemason who made much money by building chimneys which had then first come into fashion when he brought to her the profits of his jobs she counted the coins and because of this some people were jealous and told bad stories about her she declared she was thrifty but neither a miser nor a kidnapper nor a witch one day this old woman wanted more feathers to stuff into her bed to make it softer and feel pleasanter for her old bones to rest upon for what she slept on was nearly worn through so she went to a farm where they were plucking geese and asked for a few handfuls of feathers but the rich farmer's people refused and ordered her out of the farm yard shortly after this event the cows of this farmer who was opposed to chimneys and did not like her or her son suffered dreadfully from the disease called the black border as they had no horse doctors or professors of animal economy or veterinaries in those days many of the cows died the rich farmer lost much money for he had now no milk or beef to sell at once he suspected that his cattle were bewitched and that the old woman had cast a spell on them in those days it was very easy to think so so the angry man went one day to the old crone when she was alone and her stout son was away on a distant job he told her to remove the charm which she had laid on his beasts or he would tie her arms and legs together and pitch her into the river the old woman denied vehemently that she possessed any such powers or had ever practised such black arts to make sure of it the farmer made her say out loud the blessing of god be upon your cattle to clinch the matter he compelled her to repeat the lord's prayer which she was able to do without missing one syllable she used the form of words which are not found in the prayer book but are in the bible and was very earnest when she prayed forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors 
but after all that trouble and the rough way which the farmer took to save his cattle his efforts were in vain in spite of that kind of religion which he professed which was shown by bullying a poor old woman his cattle were still sick with no sign of improvement he was at his wit's end to know what to do next now as we have said this was about the time that chimneys came into fashion in very old days the kimbrick house was a round hut with a thatched roof without glass windows and the smoke got out through the doors and holes in the walls in the best way it could the only tapestry in the hut was in the shape of long festoons of soot that hung from the roof or rafters these when the wind blew or the fire was lively would swing or dance or whirl and often fall on the heads or into the food while the folks were eating when the children cried or made wire faces at the black stuff their daddy only laughed and said it was healthy or was for good luck but by and by the carpenters and masons made much improvement especially when instead of flint hatchets they had iron axes and tools then they hewed down trees that had thick cross branches and set up columns in the center and made timber walls and rafters then the house was square or oblong in other words the kimrick folks squared the circle now they began to have lattices and much later even glass windows they removed the fireplace from the middle of the floor and set it at the end of the house opposite the door and built chimneys then they set the beds at the side and made sleeping rooms this was done by stretching curtains between partitions they had also a loft in which to keep odds and ends they hung up the bacon and hams and strings of onions and made a mantelpiece over the fireplace they even began to decorate the walls with pictures and to set pewter dishes china cats and dresden shepherds in rows on the shelves for ornaments now people wore shoes and the floor instead of being muddy or dusty with pools and puddles of water in the time of rainy weather and with the pigs and chickens running in and out was of clay beaten down flat and hard and neatly whitewashed at the edges outside in front were laid nice flat flagstones that made a pleasant path to the front door flowers inside and out added to the beauty of the home and made perfume for those who loved them the rich farmer had just left his old round hut and now lived in one of the new and better kind of houses he was very proud of his chimney which he had built higher than any of his neighbors but he could not be happy while so many of his cows were sick or dying besides he was envious of other people's prosperity and cared nothing when they too suffered one night while he was standing in front of his fine house and wondering why he must be vexed with so many troubles he talked to himself and speaking out loud said why don't my cows get well i'll tell you said a voice behind him it seemed half way between a squeak and a growl he turned round and there he saw a little angry man he was dressed in red and stood hardly as high as the farmer's knee the little old man glared at the big fellow and cried out in a high tone of voice you must change your habits of disposing of your garbage for other people have chimneys besides you what has that got to do with sickness among my cows much indeed your family is the cause of your troubles for they throw all their slops down my chimney and put out my fire the farmer was puzzled beyond the telling for he owned all the land within a mile and knew of no house in sight put your foot on mine and then you will have the power of vision to see clearly the farmer's big boot was at once placed on the little man's slipper and when he looked down he almost laughed at the contrast in size what was his real surprise when he saw that the slops thrown out of his house did actually fall down and besides the contents of the full bucket when emptied kept on dripping into the chimney of a house which stood far below but which he had never seen before but as soon as he took his foot off that of the tiny little man he saw nothing everything like a building vanished as in a dream i see that my family have done wrong and injured yours pray forgive me i'll do what i can to make amends for it it's no matter now if you only do as i ask you shut up your front door build a wall in its place and then my family will not suffer from yours the rich farmer thought all this was very funny and he had a hearty laugh over it all yet he did exactly as the little man in the red cloak had so politely asked him he walled up the old door at the front and built another at the back of the house which opened out into the garden then he made the path on which to go in 
from the roadway to the threshold around the corners and over a long line of flagstones then he moved the fireplace and chimney to what had been the front side of the house but was now the back for the next thing he had a copper door sill nailed down which his housemaid polished until it shone as bright as gold yet long before this his cows had got well and they now gave more and richer milk than ever he became the wealthiest man in the district his children all grew up to be fine-looking men and women his grandsons were famous engineers and introduced paving and drainage in the town so that to-day for both man and beast wales is one of the healthiest of countries 